Sorry um, about that. And I moved out because I wanted to get more into wine after being in beverage for several years, starting all the way with Starbucks. Um, just wanted to get more into wine, did a harvest uh, for 2020, then stayed in Napa because I got bit by the wine bug. And now I currently work and I started this position in January of 2021 um, with Megan Zoback under Burgess Cellars as her winemaking vineyard and hospitality assistant. Um, and then along the way, realizing that I miss my queer community that I had in New York and realizing that in Napa, there are a lot of white professionals that were queer, but didn't really have like a connected community. I created Co-Fermented, which I also felt like was needed in the industry in general, um, which is an organization that pretty much just brings people together that are queer and creates more representation in the spaces and places that need it, like Napa. So that's the work I do. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see. Well, John I, John, I guess, is next alphabetically, but he seems to have popped off for a moment. So uh, why don't we go, Sarah, do you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. It's so lovely to be here. Thanks, Pamela, for um, inviting me on. My name is Sarah Fernandez. I'm from New York. I am uh, currently calling in from Harlem, which is unceded Winopinger. Muncie and Lenape land. Um, so I got into wine in a love of the combination of science and the sociology and the politics and the true force that is the intersection of a glass of wine and sharing it with people over a table and a good meal. And um, I come from a research-based background as a scientist for a while and unfortunately you can just make more money in wine and restaurants than you can as a public health researcher so but I fell in love with it and so I um, kind of started to I came into this profession from the restaurant scene in a later part of my life um, when I had already been pretty active and I decided to continue that activism into while well, working in restaurants and just started calling out things that I felt uncomfortable with. And um, I was part of a one of the topics here, the 2019 New York Times article that came out um, where we called out a, a sommelier for sexual abuse. And you know, I have many opinions and feelings of going through that process of calling somebody out and the after effects and what it's like for personal self care and what it's like to step forward in that space. So I'm, I'm here to talk about it all. And thank you for having me. And I'm excited to hear about everybody else. Great. Well, it's a pleasure. Um, John, now that you're back, uh, can you introduce yourself, please? You're muted, John. Sorry, classic. Um, yeah, my name is John Bigelow. Uh, I live in San Francisco. I go by he uh, slash him. Um, I've been in the wine, active in the wine industry for the last 17 years, um, selling wine wholesale for our, uh, various wine importers um, in California and other states as well. Um, before that, uh, did a little retail work and throughout my adult working career, I've been in and out of restaurants, um, for all over the U S and, um, internationally as well. And, um, just love the industry as much as, um, sometimes I want to pound my head against the wall, um, about certain facets of it, uh, among them, what we're talking about today. Um, I still um just want to bring beautiful products and food to the people oh sorry that was my mic uh, uh marie louise oh. uh do you mind introducing yourself please Yes, hi. Um, my name is Marie Louise. Um, hyphenated, go by both. So um, I also go by she, her, hers. Um, 
And I have worked in restaurants my whole life. My, I grew up in my grandparents' fine dining restaurant in San Antonio um, and have come from a family of restaurateurs. So I felt very safe and comfortable in the restaurant space. So that's really where I kind of stayed and got my um, first sort of excitement into wine. Um, and I started pretty young. I was a cheesemonger and pairing wine and cheese when I wasn't even 21 yet. So I just kind of went by what I had memorized um, and worked my way up um, through restaurants in Austin and then moved to San Francisco to be a part of sort of a larger uh, market and be um, sort of pushed a little bit harder. What I didn't realize was that I was being pushed in a really unhealthy way for many reasons. And it wasn't really until um, I moved back to Texas, to Houston. And unfortunately, you know, COVID-19 happened, but it really sort of put this very important stop on my brain that had been conditioned by the restaurant industry to kind of like push things aside and under the rug for a very long time. So I had all this time to really like think and heal and figure things out and regroup. Um, and ultimately that led me to, um, to apply for graduate school at Boston University, their uh, Masters of Arts in Gastronomy. And um, I just found it a really holistic program, a program that would allow me to study sort of whatever avenue I wanted within life sciences. And I use this approach to really kind of find a way forward in the restaurant industry through education and to see how we can sort of merge the professional and academic spheres um, so that we can kind of really provide support for anyone who learns a certain way. Um, I was also part of the um, one of the topics we were going to be speaking on um, in 2020 when the, the article came out about the court of master sommeliers. Um, it took me a long time to realize what was happening. And so I feel like it was very important to me to sort of stand up and say, like, it could it could be a very small thing, but there are there's gatekeeping and there's othering that's happening at the top. And we really need to change that in order to move forward. So um, thank you for having me. And I um, am looking forward to this conversation. Great. Thank you. Uh, Brian, would you care to introduce yourself, please? You're muted, Brian. Mute. Got it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Brian J. Springer. I'm the director of sales for Serendipity Wine Company, which is basically a organic, biodynamic, natural, and vegan distrib distributor network in California. Um, but I, I'm the manager of NorCal in charge of eight people. Um, been in the business since 1998, was a personal broker for, for collectors, been in distribution since 01, 02, I guess, 01, yeah, 02, 02. Um, and I've been with this is my third distributor and I did help do a startup at 1.2. Great. So, cool. Yeah. Thank you. And yep. Kay. Um, hi, my name is Kay Whalen. Uh, thanks for having me, Pamela. Um, nice to be here with everybody. Uh, I go by they, she pronouns. Um, I'm a non-binary gay person who has been in the um, food and beverage industry for a um, little over a decade, um, been working with natural wine since um, my first job uh, in, um, in New York as sort of like a, not quite a SOM, but, you know, working directly with wines at ISA. Um, and uh, I was the wine buyer for Kismet for about four years. Um, now I am an independent consultant um, and a broker for private collections. Um, I also do a bit of writing and I co-host uh, a podcast with my friend Sam Zimmon called Gay Wine. Um, I came to the industry and have stayed in the industry for a lot of the same reasons I'm sure uh, the rest of the folks on this panel have, which is the intersection of craft, um, community, and just like that special alchemy of pouring wine for people um, and drinking wine with people. Um, but, you know, in that, in the 
time that I've been in the industry have definitely seen some of the, the dark side of what can happen, um, you know, kind of the flip side of that alchemy as well. So happy to be here, happy to talk about it with you all. Great, well, th thank you, Kay, thank you, everybody. Uh, so as said, the overriding topic is sexism in the wine industry post Me Too, but at the outset, I do wanna say that we, when we're discussing sexism, we can't just discuss it in a vacuum. We also need to consider how gender, the, a broad definition of gender, how race, class, and sexuality uh, also impact sexism too. So, uh, and I think everyone on this panel is you know, aware of, of that as we've all been working in the industry for a long time. Just for those of you who are listening, I, again, I'm, I'm Pamela Bush, who is the host of the show, which is called Fifth Wave Radio Queerly Drinking. And I, just to give you a quick background on myself, is that I've been in the wine industry for 31 years. Um, and I didn't, I'm, I'm also, I identify as non-binary. I'm not a stickler about pronouns, but I guess, you know, they is what would be more appropriate. Uh, but earlier in my career, there was a lot of sexism. I, I was often, in, uh, like I, at one point I opened up a wine bar in San Francisco in 1994. It was like the hottest wine bar in the city. And my male buyers would get invited to ball games and all sorts of things. And I didn't, even though I probably knew more, more about sports than they did. Um, and it didn't really bother me that much because truthfully, I didn't really want to hang out with them. But as time went on, it did, it started to. And when I started to notice that I had some expectations from my generation, but when I started to notice that millennials, a lot of millennial men were almost more, not just sexist, but almost like more apparently misogynistic, uh, right. It, that's when a lot of things really started to bother me and I really started speaking out about it a lot more. And I'd say that was probably about seven, eight years ago. Uh, anyway, though, I, I just, just want to give everyone a preface because it's not like I'm, it's not like anyone ever does anything objective, but I'm definitely not objective on the subject. And I, and I do want to be very transparent about that. Uh, so let, let's discuss this a bit. Um, and, and the first thing I know both Sarah and Marie Louise, you mentioned the two articles uh, that Julia Moskin wrote in 2019. Julia wrote an article about a rising star sommelier who sexually assaulted four women. Uh, and in 2020, she wrote about, it's about the court of master sommeliers and how they have a sexual harassment pr uh, problem. And I know that you know, you're both uh, very familiar with, with the, the articles and, and the issues, as I think everyone in this panel is, is, you know, knows about it. Um, and I think that this has been a really, this, I think this has rocked our world. And, and this happened after Me Too in 2017 as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do wonder, do you think that you know, as serious as sexual violence is, that this really caused the, our, our industry to take a deep dive into the many ways sexism plays out? I know that there's been a, a lot more, there's been a lot more attention paid to sexual violence and sexual harassment, but discrimination and sexism goes you know, way beyond that. So yeah, uh, yeah what, 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 do you have any thoughts on that? Brian, it seems, sounds like you wanted to say something. Uh, am, I, am I on? Yeah, you're on. Yeah, no, actually, I actually um, pulled all of the, well, I pulled the, the workers that that's on my team now and then called a lot of my past um co-workers too um that were that identify as as women as women as she um and um that's an interesting comment just the other day by someone right now who i worked i've worked with for decades and she was mentioning that in in meetings she'll bring up a comment and then it kind of gets blown off and then <laughs> as soon as Somebody like somebody in the same table will say the same thing. And if they're a man, they actually will get a response by it. And she's just like, didn't I just say that? I mean, that's today in this day and age. So yeah, it's yeah. almost like cliche at this point. <laughs> it's like, yeah, cla classic. Like, yeah. yeah. I guess, I guess what I, I guess what I'm most guilty of is thinking that we've, you know, it's 2021, but it's, I've gotten so much feedback about how far we think we've come. And it's so strange. Oh, it's not, you know. It's, it's strangely still, the work never gets done, you know? Well, well Brian, think, oh, oh, sorry, Sarah. Sorry, I, I just, I, I just was gonna, I think that at least for me personally, and I obviously can only speak on that, um, 
the decision to sort of go to the New York Times with my experience was really just trying to say that like this type of behavior has trickled into every nook and cranny of the hospitality industry. And it comes with women or female identifying people not getting credit for their hard work or not getting credit where credit is due or, you know, and that is to me just a sign of sort of this power dynamic being established so that down the line, when something more serious happens, you've conditioned people to accept it. And that is, I think, the larger conversation about a lot of this is is power. And it can manifest in many different ways. And a lot of times it can start as, as simple as somebody having a great idea and it being pushed to the side. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to throw that in there. All right, yeah, th- thank you, uh, Marie Louise. Yeah, and I no, I I, I think what it, just this is a very common thing that that I hear, and I guess a question that I have, and I'm going to pose this question to you, Brian, because you're a sales manager, yeah, uh, and you're in a position of management. How what can you do, and other managers do, to uh, bring attention to that? Um, and, call, and really, you know, call that out when it's happening. Is that something that you're doing? Is that something that you see being done? And, and to that, I, let's say I, I'll, I ask everyone on, on the, the panel too. Um, would you like me to go first? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Um, absolutely. And, and I, I, I'm trying to be very clear about my words because um, I'm, I'm really grateful. And it may be the fact that I'm working in the organic market, you know, or, the, or not the organic market, but I'm working with a, basically an organic and natural wine company. Every, everyone on my team told me they feel incredibly safe and they feel heard. And I, and the people that I'm speaking to are the ones that work with what we, and I'm not going to name names, but the people that work with the evil empire, it's it's what we call the evil empire as far as distribution, you know, the the large, the bigger tier companies. And I'm not suggesting we're perfect and we don't have to work on it, but I, I'm just grateful to be in this situation because in my attitude is. If I'm going to have people on my team and you're not listening to everyone on your team, why are you hired? Why are you paying them? You know, I mean, there's so many more opinions. So if you just listen to the loudest voice or the most, you know, it's, you're not, there's no point of even having, you know, you're missing out on so much talent if you're not engaging every last person that you work with. So I call people alphabetically every week and just see how they're doing and, and, and get their feedback and take the time to listen to them before, however they're you know, whatever is going on with them personally, you know. But, but I mean, that, that's you, is that, do you see that your company and, you know, for like has, where there's a, a culture, they're trying to build a culture of, you know, yet where women are not being marginalized. Um, and I hate to put it in the negative, but that's, that's kind of what it comes down to. I mean, it's not yeah, just no. about having a culture of belonging, but it's having a, a culture of, yeah, you know, where this where this implicit bias is acknowledged, and and we all know there's implicit bias, you know how and different ways that it plays out in our industry against women, against people who are black, against people who are brown, etc. Uh, right. So is that is do you? And I'm asking Brian. I'm going to ask everyone else here. Do you yep. see where your colleagues are paying more attention to their imp- implicit bias? You know, especially in in regard to sexism. Again, if you're if you're asking me, I I feel like the industry, the specific part of the industry that I'm in now, again in the natural wines and biodynamic and organic, it's been I feel like it's been more endemically built by all types of people rather than by an old boys an old boys network. So there's a lot more ownership that I mean I'm well, I was brought into what by one of my female friends, you know who knows way more about this subject than I do, and everyone I feel like everyone in my company really gives, and she's also the top salesperson in our company in fact the five top salespeople in our entire state are all women all identify as female so and that may you know but maybe we have a lesson to teach um conventional wine distribution but i'm just grateful and humbled to see what i'm seeing here so so if pamela if i may so what i'm hearing from you brian and what i'm hearing from you pamela is that we're really talking about like organizations versus institutions right because like at the end of the day we are just a one cross-section of an industry 
that is these types of behaviors are replicable across all industries. That's what we've seen with the Me Too movement. It is cross industry. It is, is this is a this is a societal issue. And institutions are organiz or institutions are places which have been established in the past and are still living those principles of the time that they were established and organizations are more fluid. They're more like, in, they're more organized by the people from the ground up and can, and can live and can react to movements or the climate of the time in real time. And they're not, they're living in the moment. And so I guess one of the things that I'm hearing and that, you know, the reason why we did the article and that we ha are having these conversations is because how can we apply these principles that we're seeing in the Me Too movement and these larger movements to our individual organization? And what I'm hearing is that Brian is very like the place that you're working from our organization, you know, focus, but how can we approach the institutions in our industry and say, hey, how do you want to move forward? Because it is an individual action that causes societal ripples. And to me, it's always come, if you're asking me, and I feel like I've spoken way too much so far in, uh, at this point, but um, I think it's about money. I mean, we're, I think we're showing, we're showing people that this is the kind of wine people want to buy. And we have, and I feel like we're, we're, we're creating an organization that is allowing every voice to speak. And I just, I want to see that. I mean, until you get people in the pocketbook, you're never going to change anything. People care about getting paid. And, and that's the dumbest, most ugly way of putting it. But that's what we have to change across the entire nation is the, is the way commerce is done. But again, that's a large thing. That's a large thing to drop right now. And again, I've spoken way too much so far, right. especially well, for this topic. Well, so, so let me just add something to that. And this is a situation that I'm sure everyone here, if they haven't experienced it, is, is somewhat familiar with. Uh, you know, how often I mean, there was there there were times a few years ago when I couldn't go to wine tasting without a woman taking me aside and telling me about how there was a wine buyer who was sexually harassing her. And then I would say, well, do you talk to your manager? And she was like, yeah, my man, she would say something like, oh, well, my manager just would say, I'm just going to take you off the account. Or I would say like, well, or, you know, well, what do you want it? Maybe you need to find a different job. She'd be like, I have a mortgage to pay uh, or I have rent to pay. And I like, I under, under, you know, understand these things, but I think that, uh, yeah, this this idea that women's income to some extent is not as important as a man's income. Uh, you know, for instance, if you take a woman off that account and then you put a guy or you as the sales manager go and deal with that account, well, first of all, you're basically just kind of letting the person who is, you know, perpetrating the misbehavior get away with it. And it's also punishing you know, it's punching the, the woman who was being harassed. Uh, so, and this is incredibly common, okay? And so do you see where this is still happening? Or do you see, let's say, where there are companies that are now saying, you know what, if you're gonna sexually harass my buyer, we're not gonna do business with you. Or yeah. we're gonna like go over your head and talk to your boss and, and, and deal with this. Uh, you know, it has, and, and this isn't just, let's say in distribution, this happens in retail, this happens in all in you know different spheres of our industry. It happens in wineries. Uh, so I'd like to hear you know from some from everyone if you see some of like if how this might be shifting in terms of let's say the way that sexual harassment is being addressed by managers. Um, yeah, this is Kay. Maybe I can speak to it in a it's a slightly different context, um, but a similar issue where. You know, there's definitely been situations um, that I've experienced and that I've heard from other other people, other buyers, um, and also sales reps who go on uh, trips to um, visit winemakers um, abroad. Typically, is uh, you know that there's there's a there's a really difficult kind of nexus of. Um, you know, the, the kind of sexual harassment that we're talking about, the money situation that we're talking about, and, um, and also just like cultural differences. Um, but, you know, having this experience where a winemaker or someone related to the winemaker in some way, like someone you're tasting with, um, is like sexually harassing someone who's visiting, um, visiting that winemaker. And um, seeing how 
different distributors, different importers deal with this is a really interesting, um, I think kind of flashpoint when it comes to just like, like you're saying, you know, like we won't work with this winemaker anymore or like this person's kicked out of this party or, you know, like I, I think that it's, it's um, kind of speaking to what uh, Sarah was saying, you know, it's hard it's, it's almost, well, it's kind of the opposite where it's like, it's so deeply um, kind of community-based as opposed to institutional. It's hard to, I mean, it ends up having to be these like very individualized situations that are just like conversation by conversation, but it's definitely something that I've seen time and again, and something that, um, you know, like some, some people definitely deal with better than others. But again, it's like, you know, the, the question ends up being like, is this importer or distributor willing to basically leave money on the table or have a difficult conversation with um, the winemaker that they're importing or someone else who might, they have like some financial stake with. It's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that I've seen time and again. Yeah, uh, Marie Louise. Hi. Um, I was just gonna kind of comment on that very quickly that I agree with Kay that um, unfortunately, I have still seen a lot of this happening every day. Um, I've heard stories, I've witnessed it. Um, I've also seen companies that, and, and organizations and institutions who are standing up against it, which is great. You know, I do see that there is progress. Um, it may not be the large percentage of the world, but um, I am witnessing it. I am also witnessing sort of the same bad behavior. And I do agree that unfortunately it comes down to this, this money conversation, this like idea of, you know, that wine is, is a commodity. It's an, it's a, at the end of the day, it's like a money making venture for people. So it's hard for people to, I think, like walk away from that or to damage that relationship. Um, and I see that a lot in restaurants. Like I see that restaurants want to do right and like want to progress, but they just don't have the bandwidth to support that while also trying to make money on, on small margins. So it kind of ends up unfortunately being that like monetary decision um, that I've seen recently. Um, I, I do want to just add, can I tell a positive story? Um, yeah, I, so this is something, this is a story about stepping into your truth and your power. And um, I, well, as Pamela told everybody, I am now the office manager at Chamber Shoot Wines, which is a, although it is the best wine store in America, possibly the world, but um, it's a family run institution, it's very small. And it is all besides one other woman who's sales, uh, one other woman who works in sales, it's all men. And um, it's me and uh, this other woman fighting the good fight. And uh, I, it is also located 10 blocks away from my rape that happened in 2019. And um, about two months ago, three months ago, uh, my rapist came into the store. It's one of his favorite stores. And I went into a, a total trauma response. I shut down, I went into the cellar, um, someone had to take me home. I had a real trauma response. And when I told my boss about it, he said, oh, let's 86 this motherfucker. Right, sorry. Am I <laughs> well, yes, that is one of the five words you're not allowed to use, but uh, I, I'll put in the chat what the what the five words are. But okay, it it, it happens. <laughs> apologies, apologies, but I do yeah. think that it emphasizes the point. Um, just so I do want to just tell the success story of I was trembling all weekend, talking to everybody, like, oh my god, they're going to fire me. What am I going to do? How am I going to? even go to the shop again and I just told the truth and I told my truth and everybody was like we are 100% behind you a thousand percent and that is you know healing yourself healing the collective 
stepping into your truth and letting other people rise up with you and support you. You know, that's part of this is letting other people support you. We do this as a community. We do this together. We cannot do this individually. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sarah. And thank you for sharing that you know, with everyone. I know that it's not, um, you know, it's, it's something that I know is, is difficult to speak about and you're you're really brave for doing that. Uh, we're gonna get back to, in just a minute. We need to take a, a quick break, but uh, we'll, we'll be back for those of you who are just turning in, you're listening to Fifth Way Radio slash Queerly Drinking on KXSF LP in San Francisco. Okay, well, uh, we are back. Uh, you're listening to KXSF LP in San Francisco. This is Pamela Bush and the show is Fifth Wave Radio, Queerly Drinking. And our topic today is on sexism in the wine industry post Me Too. So Me Too happened in, you know, Me, I mean, Me Too has been happening forever, but as, as a movement, uh, it really, you know, catapulted into our consciousness in 2017 uh, when Harvey Weinstein was, you know, accused by multiple people of sexual assault and sexual harassment. Uh, in 2019, uh, Julia Moskin of the New York Times wrote an article, as we mentioned earlier, um, and Sarah is one of the people who was brave enough to come forward uh, as one of the survivors um, in this article who was you know, sexually you know, assaulted. Uh, and then a year later, Julia wrote another article on sexual harassment with the court of master sommeliers. And uh, I don't really love the word master, uh, but that is the name of it, so I will, I will say it on radio. Um, since these two articles came out, and I know there was a year you know, in between, uh, do you think that it's, how much do you think it's impacted the way our industry thinks about women? Now, let me preface this, it's a large industry. And I, and I think Brian, you hit on a, a point earlier that I think was, uh, I think interesting about kind of working, there's sort of the organic, natural wine, biodynamic sector versus the more, you know, conventional side of the industry. And uh, I guess, so my question here is for everyone is, do you think there is a difference between the way, let's say the natural, you know, lean, uh, natural and natural leaning side of the industry has addressed the, you know, sexism and the many ways it plays out, including sexual harassment and assault, you know, versus let's say the more conventional side and, and just in, in general, uh, how the industry has, has you know, addressed all of these issues since, you know, since these two articles came out. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to speak to that a little bit. I mean, I think that as someone who has worked in only the natural wine side, it's, it's hard for me to speak um, to the conventional side, aside from what I've read um, in articles like the ones that we've been talking about. Um, but I, I mean, I think that I would say like that there's sort of two things that come up for me. One is that I think it's really easy for people in the natural wine community to have sort of like this um, ethical superiority complex because of the type of wine that we work with. Um, and I think that you know, it kind of clouds sometimes or, or obscures sometimes the very real issues of harassment and discrimination that are going on within it. Um, that being said, I also think that because there is, the, I mean, speaking again to the sort of distinction between organizations and institutions, there are fewer institutions, which I think makes the, makes the conversation and the community a little bit more malleable and open um, to change. I think that especially in the last couple of years, um, people like uh, Yurka Yura who have done some really amazing work to mobilize this conversation within the natural wine community. And it's, you know, there has been a lot of openness to it um, and a lot of participation. And I've definitely seen a lot of conversations happen and have been reached out to by a lot of people who, you know, maybe wouldn't have in the past about in you know without speaking to them specifically like you know having having an importer reach out to me about an incident that he didn't respond well to in the moment you know it does mean something at the end of the day and I do think it's because these conversations have started to happen um so you know I think it's it's a complicated question and again I can't really speak to the conventional side from experience 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I definitely, I think that having, having natural wine be such a kind of anti, anti-institutional, um, I guess like praxis for lack of a better word, does make it a little bit more open to, to change, which is, which I think is a positive thing, obviously. Right. And, and Kay, I mean, I, I agree with you. And I think that some of the kind of the best examples of, of, um, uh, in, creating belonging. I've seen, you know, with from some natural wine business and people in the natural wine on the other side, some of the, the worst misogyny I've ever seen has been in the natural wine world. I mean, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna give an example here of something, uh, sort of the, you know, the kind of the after parties where you're hanging out and guys just start taking their shirts off. And, you know, you could think of oh, big deal, they're taking their shirts off. Well, I think in a professional setting, whether it's a wine shop or a tasting, it's it's not a, it's not appropriate, and it's not just about it not being professional, but it's about it's a it's a it's a display of power because women are not comfortable doing that. So it's kind of saying they could do it, and women can't. I know it makes it doesn't just make women feel uncomfortable; it makes other men feel uncomfortable, and it also ma- makes people feel unsafe. Like they're taking their shirts off. What else is going to happen next? Um, and again, I'm not I'm not this stuff might might be happening all over. I've only seen it happen kind of in, in some natural white circles. And uh, you know, I would like to, it's kind of interesting because that's I personally have not been in a situation like that in way over five years because I just don't hang out with those people and I'm not in, in those circles. But I saw a photograph recently that I and I'm not sure how old it was, but I know that it was taken probably within the last year or two. Uh, that I thought was kind of inappropriate too. Um, anyway, so that I, I get, I totally get what you're saying. You know, on the other hand, I, I do think that there are people in the natural wine world who uh, have been very responsive, very responsive to it. Uh, you know, with the thing with the conventional wine world, that it's a little different, especially when you're dealing with like stuff that's a little bit more corporate is they have HR departments, right? So of course they're, you know, they're, they're trying to cover their ass. I'm allowed to say ass. I just can't say a word that might come after that. Uh, and so, yeah, I think that when it comes to at least to issues of like sexual harassment and violence, I would hope that, uh, you know, their HR departments are really on it too. But I honestly, I can't speak to it because I don't really, you know, I don't, not involved in the conventional wine world very much these days either. Uh, and, H- and HR yeah. is there to protect the company. So. Of course, yeah. HR is there to protect management and, and the company, but they don't want to get sued. So, you know, they're going to try to make some things very clear. Uh, you know, what you know, it? Yeah, no, I, if you don't mind, I, I completely agree with your, like, sentiment of, like, how are we categorizing, how are we placing, like, all of these things. Like, you can't do that because, again, this behavior mm-hmm. is... In cross institutionalized, this is an ingrained societal, like basic. This is something that we are socialized from birth to understand about gender differences. And like, we are just talking about the realm of which we occupy, which is natural wine and wine and what we can influence. You know, we could be, if we were artists, we'd be having this conversation. If we were bankers, we'd be having this conversation different, you know, like this is a cross institutional conversation. And also to go on your point, why are we having this conversation in this industry so loudly is because this industry captures the most vulnerable of all you know they we are the catch-all we are the restaurants we take you in when you have no papers we you know you need to you're a migrant you are you need to make some money this season like we are here to hold you and help you get on your feet and that's what this industry does but it also takes advantage of the most vulnerable in that sense and they have are marginalized and they're beat down in ways of, again, institutional, think of like, this is what we do at a restaurant. This is how a winery works. These are the ways in which we have been socialized to believe that these things have to happen. Mm -hmm. And we're having this conversation to break that because again, I would like to bring feudalism was to prevailing economic, you know, program for a very, very long time. And, uh, I know, I know the the wine, the hospitality restaurant industry is very much based on a feudal uh, model of you know 
of economics. I mean, there's no question about it. And, and we are starting to see some changes in, in various ways, but I, I don't want to get too much off topic. I think you know, one thing that, that you mentioned, Sarah, and this is I, I, something I wanted to bring up is that you know, we're socialized, especially like with prescribed gender roles at such an early age. Uh, but you know, now so many more people, some of us identify as non-binary. Uh, you know, there are people who are not cisgender in our industry. But do you feel that the industry is becoming, and let's say the spheres that we're in within this industry are becoming more welcoming to people who are not cisgender identified? For instance, do you see like, I mean, pronouns, I know it seems like a small thing, but it's very symbolic. Do you see, let's say that pronouns are being respected? Uh, and, and just that, you know, that if somebody is not cisgender, that they're given opportunities and that they're not, not treated differently. I wanted to talk about this. Um, <laughs> Thanks. This is Darwin speaking. Yeah. Hi, I'm Darwin. Um, I just saw a little bit more context. I've been in the restaurant industry since because of my parents. They've owned several restaurants growing up. So I pretty much grew up into it. And I started working in restaurants outside from my parents when I was 13 uh, because of my high school. So I was, I've been in the industry and around wine and around the hospitality industry for over 10 years. And one thing that throughout my cumulative experience up until, I guess this is like a little bit, um, and within the, the same context is um, that when going into restaurants, when going into spaces where you have to act or be a certain way, there's always been the context of like, well, you also can't have piercings. You also can't have your hair colored. You also can't like show off your tattoos that has opened up a bit more. And it's like all these little things that kind of prevent us from being who we are. And I only bring this up because now that I, I that, I identify as non-binary and I choose to wear feminine and masculine clothing or kind of like to break that narrative apart. Um, I don't feel, at times I feel like I'm welcomed. And then at times I just feel like I'm, when I go to wine events and I might wear a skirt and a blazer, like, and I know it's like a little thing, but I, like it impacts me and I do it because it's who I, what I feel most comfortable in. And then when I go to these wine events or these wine spaces, I am just like patted in the back, like good job for like doing what you're doing by like older white men. And like, it's like, I don't like a part of me wants to feel like, yeah, they're really trying. And then a part of me, it's like, well, you can't even say my pronouns correctly. and You only use them when I'm around. So I don't have to say something. And I think, when you restrict someone uh darren i think you just froze that's himself yeah oh, okay there and you go a, yeah, yeah. i'm sorry do, do you mind just you just froze for a second do you mind just re repeating what you, you said for you said a few seconds ago Oh, I said when you put people in the primaries and you limit them um, based on clothing and how they can express themselves, you limit how comfortable and how confident they are in the work environment and who and the what they have to offer. Like, period. I've 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 felt it. I've seen it. And one story I wanted to bring up, which uh, translates into a positive story. Um, the, one of the brands that I've worked for since moving to Napa, they were building a tasting room. And in the process, they hired um, a whole tasting room group. All of them were white men, <laughs> um, cis white men. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, even with all the work that everyone's doing and the organizations that exist and like, this is still happening. So my winemaker on the production side, we're, we're mostly all, um, mo it's mostly all women. And I, at least in the cellar, I'm the only male presenting individual, but I identify as non-binary. So there was one woman in the tasting room that was hired. And I, off the bat, like, like knew that there was going to be like a conversation about like how she felt in that environment. Her and I would always talk about it. Then it got a little bit more intense when they installed a uniform because I, she was then told to wear khaki pants, a white shirt uh, and like a design tie and apron. And I, I was like, how, like, 
you're this is supposed to be like new Napa, like new wine, trying to cater to different demographics of people, but you're still dressing us like we're in the 60s and we work at a post office. Like I just it just didn't make any sense to me. And she like told me like this is taking away from what I have to offer. I don't feel confident in this clothing. And I feel like everyone is just looking at me like the odd person out. So we brought it to the manager's attention. I helped her kind of curate like, you know, how to confront this because she kept talking about it, but nobody kept understanding her. And I think that it's something I'm very passionate about. I don't really agree with uniforms in general. I, If you're gonna have a uniform policy, uh, make people want to wear what they wanna wear, keep it at a standard. Like they, they could have gone around this so many different ways, um, but it's in a way kind of dehumanizing and like, for her, she was just like, I don't like, I don't like, I don't want to be here when I have to wear this manly uniform um, and I can't be myself. So it's something that um, it ended up, she ended up leaving, but it did bring the conversation to the forefront and they are redesigning the uniform. So <laughs> I think in a way it kind of helped. And I just, my perspective, I don't want anyone to come into a space and feel like they're restricted on who they can be, especially like coming, knowing many people that are non-binary, we like to kind of challenge the status quo on like what we can do and what we can wear and what professionalism actually means. And it doesn't need to have a specific like standard and like dress code. Um, but that's all. That's <laughs> well, you, you <laughs> know, just, ju just to piggyback on, on what you said, I had in, uh, in uh, kind of an email exchange with somebody earlier and I'm just going to read what, what she, what she said. Uh, Cause I think it was really uh, you know, it, it just it struck me and I would love to hear what all of you uh, think about this. She said, I've had experiences where I'm working and have sweat on my forehead while working, lifting up my shirt to wipe it off my shirt and had bosses say, be careful, you don't want to distract coworkers. As a fat black femme, it can be discouraging to feel like I must be covered head to toe while others have muscle shirts and, and jean cutoffs. Did you get all that? So How does she like she says she's a black femme yeah, woman? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's also a, you know, Matt, I think a question here of, of body type too. Uh, you know, she, you know, she says she is she's a, a, a fat black woman. So, you know, I think when we're also having we're talking about sexism, another thing is God, we need to talk about body types and how women are are judged on their body types in you know ways that men are not too. Uh, totally and the contradictory yeah. nature which everything like uh, somebody who's perceived as feminine is viewed as sexual versus you know and sexualized versus a person who's perceived as male is just you know seen as with a neutral and honestly like with a good intent versus mm -hmm. like a female a perceivable or perceived as female or seen as sexual and with a devious intent yeah yeah uh, so you know what I, I wonder is what you know we we have like things that we, I think we've all become more conscious of certain issues than we were a couple of years ago, but is it being again is it being addressed? And if so, how how do does anybody see different ways that this is being addressed? You know, so like you know, Darren, you gave a, a I think a, a good example here. Um, I personally am not a fan of uniforms because I think it it breeds you know it's trying to be conformity in, con into people, but uh, you, like this is a situation in a winery you know is how is is anything being done about this John it looks like you were going to say something yeah I think um, not to throw water on on this conversation but I think we need to be somewhat realistic in that we are you know we're coming from very um, progressive urban environments everyone on this panel and um, a lot of us are in the natural and organic wine world, you know, more accepting. Um, so we're talking about some very small niche, um, you know, they're big urban environments. But, you know, when we talk about the industry as a whole and across, of, across the U.S. and the world, you know, there's a lot of um, backwards thinking people that are still fully involved in this industry and, you know, the old boys network. And, you know, I don't want to throw any states under the bus but um there's a lot of you know red states out there that you know this type of conversation no nobody wants their 
their business in the press negatively. And I think um, that we've had a series of gut punches in that regard um, with a lot of um, pretty prominent restaurants. Um, but I, I question whether this conversation is going on in you know small Midwest markets at all. Um, you know, maybe the organic foods uh, restaurant in, you know, Des Moines, Iowa, perhaps, but, you know, it's a diner and, you know, in Omaha, Nebraska, you know, I, I question that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, one thing, though, is I do think that often, and not that everyone on this panel is in California, but uh, often, you know, what happens in Cal California does influence the rest of the country. But yes, I, I agree with you, John. And I think there'll be, you know, this is, I'd love to do another, you know, like a part two of this conversation with people who are in, in smaller markets and markets that tend to be less progressive. I think you're raising a, a very good point here. I, I can speak on that because I worked in um, Texas and then San Francisco. And even though I worked in Austin, Austin is not as progressive as one might think it is. It still exists within Texas. And Houston is significantly behind Austin in that in that regard. There are some wonderful places. I think that there's I think that there are people in every single size market and every single nook and cranny of this country that are have, fighting the fight and having the conversation. Um, I think what that conversation is looks like it is very different depending on where you are. Um, I know that there were battles I took upon myself in Houston that I felt like would have not even been a conversation in San Francisco. Um, you know, I think what it comes down to is like these, these small but consistent conversations and changes. Um, and that whatever the topic may be, depending on what market you're in, they like need to happen. Um, and I think that the best way to do it is to like, I, I, for me, the best way to do it was that I always sort of picked one thing and I just was like annoying about it nonstop. <laughs> and I think that eventually that kind of like will tell me what I need to know about the business um, or it will kind of spur a larger conversation. But um, definitely much different conversations uh, that I was having in Texas than I than I did on the West Coast. Well, how long ago were you working in Texas? Um, literally up until August of 2020. Okay, so, so you know there was a lot through, I've been, through the pandemic. Yeah, and I'll, you know through like the beginning of Me Too and the mm -hmm. and the New York Times articles. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean I I do. I, I do wonder about that. I think, yes, but the, of course, there are co conversations that need to be happening all over the country, and we are uh, in markets where they tend to be happening. But I guess it's also how you know, it's up to companies that, that work in other markets. Let's, I mean, not to pick on you, Brian, but like serendipity that that does, you know, as a national company, uh, to be the ones to, you know, to start having these conversations in other markets too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we need to take another quick break. We'll be back in, in just a minute. So uh, for those of you just tuning in, you are listening to KXSF LP in San Francisco 102.5 in the Bay Area. And the show is Fifth Wave Radio, Queerly Drinking. My name is Pamela Bush, I'm the host. And our, our topic today is sexism in the wine industry. And we have several uh, Terrific guest here joining us. I'll just uh, quickly reintroduce them. Darren Acosta, who uh, is the founder of uh, Coferment and, or Cofermented, excuse me, and uh, also works at Burgess Cellars. Uh, John Bigelow, who is a 17 year wine industry veteran and uh, currently works for Terra Firma Wine Imports. Sarah Fernandez, who is a New York City based uh, wine industry veteran and is the office manager for Chambers Street Wines. Mary Louise Friedland, uh, who is a sommelier and graduate student at Boston University of Work Astronomy. Brian Springer, the Cali Northern California Director of Sales for Serendipity Wines. And, and Brian is also a founder of KXSF uh, and one of the DJs for Barn Dance, which is uh, happening later on this evening. 
on the station and Kay Whalen, who is a writer and consultant based in Los Angeles. So thank you. I know we've we've covered a lot of ground and uh, there's, I do want to bring up a couple of other uh, topics that I think are somewhat related uh, to what we're discussing here. Uh, so, yeah, you know, we had in 2017 kind of Me Too, and then in, or not kind of, we did, and then 2019, there was the uh, first article that Julia Moskett wrote about uh, Anthony Kalin, a uh, sommelier in New York City, who uh, was accused of sexually assaulting four women. Uh, and, uh, you know, Sarah spoke to that a little bit earlier. Uh, and Mary Louise Friedland uh, was also uh, you know, has a lot to say about yeah, the Court of, of Master Sommeliers, uh, which we haven't really gotten to yet. And that's an article that came out in 2020. So before getting onto anything else, Mary Louise, I'd, I would like to talk a little bit about the, that, you know, the kind of the situation with the, you know, with the court. And, you know, it's, I sort of, I personally look at the court as sort of this codified you know, we were talking about feudalism before. And to me, I think that's a very good example of feudalism in a lot of ways where you sort of have this sort of, you know, in a way self-appointed elite court. I mean, yes, it's not totally self-appointed because you have to take tests and other people, but you know, as I said, I've been in this industry for three decades. And to me, from the very beginning, I was like, this is just an old boys network. Even if there are women involved in it, it's just the, the, the norms, the culture of it was very much of an old boys and just not progressive, you know, that like, I don't even know if they acknowledge natural wine now, but they it was like never really in their mind. Uh, you know, when this story, when that story came out in 2020, um, I think it, it definitely, I think there are a lot of people who are like, yeah, what, what do you expect? Uh, but I think, you know, for a lot, the, the court was also very highly respected too. So, yeah, what was kind of your perspective or what is your perspective on that? Um, how so? <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, well, just as far as like, okay, do you, do you think, and if anyone else here has, you know, would like to contribute to this, do you think that uh, having bodies like the, the CMS that are, you know, that are, that are just heavily, they're incredibly entrenched in a, a culture of patriarchy, do you think that they really mm -hmm. serve the wine industry? You know, do you, no. do you, okay. No, um, no, I, I was one of the, uh, the few that truly wanted um, the, the dissolution of the organization as sort of the resolution to what we were sort of fighting for, because I, I did really believe that it's confusing to so many people that an organization like that can still exist and be accessible when um, they're not, they just aren't really being held accountable for what um, happened. Um, that's also really why I um, kind of pursued graduate school because I really wanted another option. I really wanted to like, better educate myself so that I could then create another outlet for people to learn about wine. Because when you're young, and I, I took my first level when I was 22. So I like, truly was like, I didn't, you know, the, the place that I was working was like, oh, this is how you get certified. And I was like, okay, great. Um, you know, young, naive, trustworthy. <laughs> the things that they love to take advantage of. So, um, you know, to me, that was the way that you learned about wine. And now we know that there are so many more outlets. Why do they still hold the power? Why do they still hold the power to tell people whether or not their knowledge of wine or how they serve wine is worthy of what, of a higher pay grade, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I truly don't think that it needs to exist. I truly don't think that anything that is that much of a of a sort of power hungry gatekeeping organization um, needs to exist. I can't tell you how many times and this kind of will piggyback off of what Darwin said. I can't tell you how many times I was told what I could wear, what I could not wear at an exam. I was explicitly told I could not wear a dress or I would fail. 
And I was like, why is that distracting to someone that I would wear a dress? Like, I, you know, it, it just, it's outdated. It's incredibly sexist. And they have even taken that to a whole other level where they are not transparent. And the, the lack of transparency about what you're learning and what you need to learn has allowed them to prey on people. And that is just like, for me, I'm just like, not good. (laughs) You know, like our profession, I think deserves better. And I think it deserves access to very transparent, inclusive and diverse wine education materials. Well, do you think I don't that, know if that answered the question? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, not. It, it's like my rant. <laughs> no, sure. sure. I, I know. I think you make you know, clearly like I understand uh, where mm-hmm. you're coming from. And it's like, do bodies like that? Is it a matter of uh, where they just need to be dissolved or can they be transformed? And, you know, you're talking about like this is a codified, these are like a codified group of gatekeepers. But there are a lot of gatekeepers that, you know, it may not be sort of an, something official like the like the cms but where you, you still have that um and you, where there there's still very much and in you know many instances it's still basically white males uh that are happening so it's like you know we, mm-hmm. you can you can you can dissolve, dissolve the cms you can say that needs to go but then it's i think it, it's not just about like okay we're going to get rid of this one organization it's like we have a, a bigger systemic problem going on. Oh, absolutely. I am like not arguing that. I think that it is in every nook and cranny, but I think that that organization symbolizes a lot um, for people in the industry, specifically sommeliers that are working in restaurants or wine bars or like customer facing roles. And I do think that it would say a lot if we could kind of take that symbolism away. And, and I, and I, personally have given them many shots. I've given them three shots after, you know, the, the article came out to kind of like do right and to see if they could fix things. And they have not, in my opinion. So um, I'm always one for letting people try and do right and, and make amends, but they did not. And so in my mind, I think it would be much more of a symbolic gesture at this point to be like, our industry is not going to stand for that. It's all for optics now. Like I was in the same boat as you. I was 21. I was in culinary school and I really wanted to get into wine. And I was told the same thing. Like this is how, and this is a structure that exists. I had no idea what the W set was until like I got into wine production and um if from conversations i've had with winemakers like the w set was much more respected because it because of just because of what this cms and that whole course symbolize and I, it just comes down to like money and power again it's like you like why like it's so much information and it's like so expensive and yeah the other certifications do cost as much as well but it's like it's there's not like all that history and all the crap that, that like the core has like pushed and like covered and have not been transparent about, you don't really see in the other like communities that provide the structure in wine. And it's like, I have many conversations with, with my friends that are in wine and they're like, well then like, where do we go? And I'm like, there's so many outlets. Like you like, there shouldn't even be, in my opinion, like there's so many different like ways you can attain information. The like the the thing about having a piece of paper, I think it comes down to the individual with the certification. I think it hurt like a lot of these organizations, even though they might provide, um, they provide structure and they provide like a sense of discipline. You can still find that anywhere else, and you can add yourself your own sense of discipline and like just study the material. All the information is out there, so it's. I don't know. I've also given the CMS a few chances. I've even considered when I like, should I go for my certified? And then every time that they like something goes out, I'm just like, you know, you think that they would do better. And it's like, they go one step, like one step forward. And it's like, you could be so much far more ahead. Like you could have taken 20 steps, but you've only done this one thing, like really. So I don't know. It's, it's a, 
there's a lot of bigger conversation because it's like everything that they stand by and what they've done obviously relate to a lot of what we're dealing with in society. And I think it comes on to ethics and morals and there's a bigger conversation, but I don't, I think they need to be dissolved. And I think their resources and everything that they stand for needs to like, shouldn't exist, but that's me. That's my perspective on it. Yeah. 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 No, it- if I may, sorry, really quickly, but Darwin and Marie, thank you so much, Marie. I think what you just said is like perfect and spot on for the court and Darwin, I totally agree. And this is another example of an institution. An institution will not change. They are stuck in a point of time. They are not fluid. They are not evolutionary. They will continue to function on morals that they don't, that are not congruent with the current time and pace that's needed and healing. Sorry, that's all. That's okay. Well, I think, Kay, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, you know, like there's, I feel like the CMS conversation is kind of the intersection of a lot of things that we've been talking about. I mean, like talking about uniforms, there's like a uniformity of thought that's expected out of this institution and out of a lot of these certification programs. I mean, I think that I think that the symbolism thing is a big part of it. I mean, the fact that like, I still get asked if I'm going to get certified, like a lot of people who aren't in our industry, aren't even aware that this institution is such a problem. Like it's, I think it would say so much if it were to be dissolved so that the response to that question could be like, actually, no, that institution doesn't exist anymore. Like it, it was a problem and it needed to be, it needed to be dissolved. And it's not just a problem for, you know, the institutional violence that it's caused for, you know, decades at this point. It's, it's also a problem because, you know, like education should not be this. I mean, it, it, you know, like Darwin was speaking to how much it costs. And yes, like there are other programs that cost just as much, but you know, the fact that wine education is something that you can gain by experience and mentorship. I mean, that's the entirety of my education in, in wine has been through different jobs and, and asking questions and getting the opportunity to um, like taste and talk with winemakers, et cetera. You don't have to pay thousands of dollars to have an enriching wine, wine career. It's really not, um, necessary. And I think that institutions like CMS that basically broadcast this idea that you need to have this piece of paper, you need to spend this money in order to have, uh, have success in this industry. It's a crock. And it's like, it's such a, it's, you know, it's, it's like, it flies in the face of accessibility. It flies in the face of like so many of these different, um, different, core values that I think a lot of people in the wine industry actually do want to pursue, which is like, you know, not just accessibility in terms of, you know, financial security and, 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 you know, like access to information, but also like accessibility in the sense where people of all communities are well, are welcome and, and, and are able to participate And I think that's like largely what we're talking about is like who feels welcome, who feels able to participate in the wine industry at large. But I think that like the CMS in particular is a really good example of something that is not only just part of the problem, but like systemically the problem. Yeah. (laughs) abolish it <laughs> yeah yeah you know and that actually leads me to one thing that I, I want to bring up too and I think that that's really you know Marie Louise and, and uh Kay that's both that I mean everyone very well said uh in 2020 in addition to the pandemic you know when you know after Brianna Taylor was murdered and George Floyd was murdered uh you know we began to have more conversations about race in this country and in the industry and now, I've, I've heard some, yeah, you see like wine shops with signs that say Black Lives Matter. And yeah, I, I've kind of heard some stories about where like one person who, someone who is, let's say, a, you know, white store owner would say to someone who's Black, hey, what do you need? You know, happy to like support you, et cetera. But it was just kind of words. Nothing really, you know, it was just sort of like saying in the moment. Uh, 
I, you know, I, as I said at the beginning of the show, when we discuss sexism, we, you, we can't just talk about it on its own. You know, we need to we need to also bring racism and, and other forms of marginalization into it. And I, I think that we only have a few minutes left, but I really do want to talk about racism in the industry and in particular how black women in our industry, black and brown women uh, and you know, Asian uh, American women are you know, particularly impacted by sexism. Uh, and if there have been, you know, si like, especially since 2020, if you've seen any changes. Should I take the silence as a, as a no? <laughs> well, I was gonna say is like, just to answer the overarching question that you're posing here, it's like, no, have we seen any changes? No, we haven't seen any systematic overarching maybe some small individual changes, but no, nothing has happened. That's why we wrote the follow-up piece to mm -hmm. the New York Times article. That's why the other New York Times article came out. Like, no, we haven't. Hot take, sorry. No. Uh, you know, I mean, I, uh, sorry, Darwin, go ahead. I was just gonna say we've def we've seen like small changes like community efforts, but on a larger scale, yeah, I I agree with Tara. There there hasn't been a change, and it I don't like it's just it's very disappointing to see like how much more crap needs to happen or like what is it really gonna take. This is it's it's crazy. <laughs> Well, do you feel like there's a, a backlash going on? A backlash like towards I mean, the industry, the industry towards us. Well, I think no, I think that do you feel like there is, because I, you know, I've started to hear more about in certain fields where there's there is a little bit of a backlash going on because there is a resentment that that white men in particular are resentment, are resentful about maybe not getting hired, uh, not getting promoted, feeling that they don't have opportunities are being passed over for people, you know, by, by women or people who are non-binary, um, people who are not white. And do you see that starting to creep into the wine industry in any way? Honestly, I feel like they are still getting hired. So I don't know, I don't know that I, I haven't, yeah. I don't know about, a, I haven't heard personally, I haven't experienced personally, like conversations where there, there is that resentment. Um, but I, I honestly, I mean, I, I feel like those people are still getting hired. Yeah, for sure. And if there is a situation where someone else gets hired over them, tough luck. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> well, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, just from my experience, what, what I see, you know, here, in the Bay Area, which is a, a progressive community, yes, there are still a lot of you know, white men in the industry. Uh, and but I, and th this is, I guess, if, you know, as we only have a few minutes left, trying to end uh, on a slightly positive note is that over the last couple of years, I have met a lot more people of color working in the industry uh, and people who've just kind of been wanting to get into, you know, maybe they've had like one vintage of winemaking. Uh, or, and that's where I, I see it, uh, you know, people of color a little bit more on the winemaking side um, and definitely more within the natural wine sector. Again, I don't really pay a lot of attention to the conventional wine world, uh, but I do see here in the Bay Area uh, where I'm meeting more people who are not white uh, than five years ago. Okay, yes, I do see that. Uh, and perhaps also within natural wine, there is a little bit more of a culture of belonging than you would find in the, you know, broader wine section. And I, again, I can't, I can't say that that for sure. Uh, having said that, it seems to me like it, it's still, it's still so dominated by patriarchy, where even if it's not white men who are, you know, it's not maybe, you know, it have all the positions there's still this sort of patriarchal way of doing business. Uh, and now I, I do, I know that there are some, some businesses that are, that really are trying to promote ideas of equity and, 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 and having like shared leadership. Uh, but that just seems to me like it's very much the minority. And uh, 
I mean, I'll just say, I'm, I think that until we start really looking about the, the culture that we have and how much patriarchy and, and white supremacy, which and go hand in hand, how they're so deeply embedded, uh, you know, ev even in like really progressive, you know, more progressive sectors like natural wine, because there is so much implicit bias. And as Sarah said at the beginning of, of the show, you know, from the time that we're young, we're socialized in a certain way. So you might vote for Bernie, but that doesn't mean that you don't have all these other implicit biases too. And I, I personally still see that playing out. And I think that until companies really start addressing it and started really addressing their, their culture, we're, we're not going to see that, that much change. It seems that the change we're going to see is going to be performative, you know, whether it's dealing with sexism or, or dealing with race. But then anyway, that's, a, that's, a, that's my little tirade. conversation. Yeah. That, <laughs> Sorry, go I ahead, I was going to add, um, yes, uh, I have definitely have seen a lot of organizations like provide more education opportunities, experiences, internships for people of color. And myself, I've definitely, like, I, because of the Roots Fund, which is to help people of color get into white, it's why I am in Napa. So yes, there are organizations that are doing the work, um, but it, like, there's still so much more that needs to be done on a larger scale. And it is, it is amazing to see all these organizations provide these opportunities. I think another conversation that needs to happen is like, yeah, now you're taking these individuals from where they're, where, wherever they're from, from their comfort and placing them in this new environment that has, you know, that is system and so many other issues. Where's the follow-up? <laughs> where's the uh like sometimes it's like yeah we've we did this is great we moved you from here to the other side of the world and now you're in the wine industry and you know it's all great i i found my community and people have too but it's still challenging to have to navigate at certain times in these spaces when it's not really catered to individuals like women or queer folks in general and you know, like I was talking to my friends about this right before this conversation. I was like, I still like, even though I've had, I have a lot of support, I still feel very foreign in this industry. <laughs> Many times that I go into spaces, I still feel like I am either not seen, no matter if I stand out because of my outfit. Um, it's like, you know, I'm like battling this, like, like I just feel heavy every day. And, you know, I know it was supposed to end on a more positive note, but <laughs> we, 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 we don't uh, um, have to end on a positive note. That I wanted. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I try to be as positive as I, as I can about many situations. And I think that because these conversations might not be happening in the middle, like in the middle states or in places where we don't think they'll be happening, I think it's important that we are having them and that we are being very vocal and uh, as loud as we can be about these conversations, because I, I think that every conversation people are listening and they ripple. Um, so, I mean, I'm all about creating creating ripples that lead to waves. Um, that's just me. And as long as there's people that still need help and still need access and there's work to be done, it's something that I stand for. And I think, I think it's like we all come together and it's going to take a lot of time for, I guess, the entire society of the world to shift from money to people. I think it's going to, it's that obviously it's not going to happen overnight, but I think we are the beginning steps. Um, so yeah, that's just my take on it. Well said, uh, Marie Louise. I just, I agree. I think the more conversations <laughs> we have like this, the more it's out there. The more somebody is like actively engaged in the how can we make this better conversation, then I don't know, optimist at heart, I guess. I feel like that's what's going to make the difference. Yeah, more, more conversations over optics. I feel like the optics conversation, or I guess, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, I guess the, the optics situation is, is often what kind of takes over the conversation. Um, you know, people hiring and thinking, you know, the representation is going to solve the issue, but it's really, it is about, you know, more dialogue. I can, um, I can sort of reverse what I said earlier about, um, you know, the the big urban markets and our industry and in that a, a good friend of mine is 
a um, he does corporate coaching. And since the Me Too movement and since BLM, he has seen a, just an extraordinary growth in interest in what he's doing. Um, that said, they're mostly by very large companies that bring him in and speak to middle management and all that. But it is it is things like that that really, you know, those people aren't in that industry forever. People might have I ideas of starting a restaurant or whatever so it's it's um things like that that help to um trickle down into the mainstream of thinking and you know we've we've progressed a lot in the last uh, two or three years but there is uh, there's so much more work to be done so yeah thank you for all of that i also want to bring to the point of like that the wine industry is deeply rooted in these uh, countries that are the main proponents of coloni uh, colonialism and like ultimately at the end of the day we need to start to decenter, decolonize our view of what wine is, who holds the power in wine, right? Going back to power equals money in our capitalist capitalistic society um, and just recognizing that like we are looking at trying to get to deeply rooted colonialist issues here and um, knowing that that's gonna take some time and um, continuously and standing in your truth and your power of having these conversations. So thank you everybody for you know putting in this work today. Well, thank you, Sarah. I think that that's really well put and I think it's a good place for us to wrap up here. Uh, Again, this this is a conversation that could go on and on. I think that we covered a number of topics that, you know, where each one deserves a lot more attention than it was given. But I'm hoping that at least for anyone who's listening, yeah, it's been somewhat thought provoking. And if you, you know, let's go have these conversations, especially in places where these conversations are not already existing. You know, that's that's how we're going to really start to uh, uh, affect change. So. Uh, I want to thank my guest, and I'm just gonna, as I'm looking at everyone on my, on my screen here. Thank you so much, Kay, for being here. Sarah, always Brian, uh, Darwin, John, and Marie Louise. It's it's been a pleasure. It's been a great conversation. I really appreciate all of your time, and I wish everyone a a safe and you know, joyous uh, holiday season and rest of your new year. I know that with the this new variant, it's definitely throwing a wrench in a lot of people's plans, but I hope that everyone here, <laughs> Brian just gave me the thumbs down. I hope that every everyone here can, uh, you know, we all we all can find some moments where we have some some peace and joy and that 2022 brings, every, you know, health and a, a wine industry that has these conversations and really does foster belonging. Thank you so much. Uh, every, for everyone who's listening, you are listening to KXSF LP in San Francisco, 102.5. We will be right back in just a moment.